Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. It's a beautiful, sunny summer's evening here. This is all natural light behind me. I'm not using any uh, panel lights or anything today. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, Diana's with me. She's doing the chat today. So just say hi to everyone and we'll get straight on to the webinar. OK, so. Did you want to just mute yourself, Diana, and then we'll yeah, and then we'll get on. OK, cool. OK, look at this. We've got several hundred people interested in this uh, webinar and this online course, and it's called Distance Healing for Shiatsu Practitioners. OK, it's a four week course, and this is webinar one of five webinars. I'll explain more as we go along. OK, great. So I'm glad you can. Glad you're interested in this topic. And um, as we go through, I'll just give you some um, information about it and just see how we're going. OK, so this is the course overview. So in this webinar, we're going to be looking at the whole issue of distance healing. Um, we're going to look at how whether it can be explained scientifically. We're going to look at some of the scientific evidence that might support these type of modalities. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do some energy work exercises to help prepare you in case you'd like to do some distance healing work yourself. I'm going to find out in a minute whether you're already doing it. Um, and then the following webinars, we're going to look at all kinds of different forms of connecting to another person. We're going to do some practice next week. We're going to do some practice distance healing sessions with you, and I'm going to talk you through one. So next week, please bring or at least tell someone or get in touch with someone so you can work on them uh, as a little 15 minute session. Um, and then uh, webinar three, we're really excited because Gabriella Polly, who's a very, very famous international teacher, um, she's been doing distant work during lockdown and she's been having some incredible results with it. And so we thought we'd invite her on. She can describe how she's been doing it. And then webinar four, we've got putting it all together. And our very own Shakura Meddings has actually been studying with a Chinese Qigong master for the last few years. And she's been all over the world to China, Hawaii, studying it. And she's been studying distance techniques. So we thought we'd get her in here and ask her how she does it. OK. And then we webinar five is a review. So we've got five webinars, four weeks uh, for the course in between all the webinars. OK, so let's go. OK, so there is an online course running alongside these webinars. It's a four week course, like I said, um, we've got um, it's already up. So if you're a free member or a, uh, what used to be a professional member, one of our supporters, you will already have that course in your dashboard. Obviously, it's just started. Um, it's an eight hour CPDC course um, and it's free to everyone because we are relying entirely on generous donations to keep everything going, as you probably know. OK, so cool. Yeah, the online course is there. It's already been loaded with some links. I did that this morning, so it's already for you. Um, some of the links from this webinar. And that's what it looks like. That's the course uh, card, Distance Healing for Shiatsu Practitioners. OK, now, before we go any further, I'd just like to say that this whole subject has caused quite a bit of controversy uh, across the world. Uh, partly because we put out some very popular webinars right at the beginning of coronavirus helping shiatsu practitioners all over the world to take their work online. And we were describing what we were doing, which, as I said, was self shiatsu support. And it was also distance uh, healing work. We called it distance shiatsu healing. And I'll explain why later in this course. That's because the information we were processing and working with was within the shiatsu model. However, that turned out to be quite controversial. And a lot of people got very upset about it. Um, and um, so what we've decided to do this time so that we don't upset anyone is we're going to call it distance shiatsu for shiatsu practitioners. So we're looking at distance healing, sorry, distance healing for shiatsu practitioners to keep the shiatsu away from it. And we're just going to explore that whole that whole thing. OK, so, yeah, the online course is there waiting for you. And if you want those CPD points, that's good. OK, so let's have a look at what we're going to be doing in the next 55 minutes. Well, I thought we'd investigate why we think it's important for you to know about it, whether you do it yourself, whether you even believe it's possible. I think it's important or we think it's important that you know about it. And I'll tell you why in a little bit later. We'll look what, at what distance healing actually is. We're going to look at 
with how it could work, what possible mechanism it could be that it could work. OK, we're going to look at the actual scientific evidence, the research that's been done into distant techniques and see what research evidence there is out there. So we get that over and over with in the first part of the webinar. So we've got some um, uh, we've got something to uh, work with. I've got quite a lot of polls for you as well, because I want to find out about you and about your relationship to distant work. OK, and then um, and then I thought we'd use the second half of the webinar to do some actual energy work exercises that I think are very important for you um, if you want to develop your distant work, distance healing work. OK, uh, now I know lockdown is finishing for a lot of you in different countries, especially in Europe. We're still completely locked down here in terms of shiatsu. We don't know when we're going to go back. But actually, I think personally, it's a useful thing to be able to do in case you have vulnerable clients um, who want to have uh, a session like that. They don't want to maybe come into your clinic because they're worried about the virus or maybe they just can't come in anyway because they are too sick or whatever. I have to say that before coronavirus, we kept this very quiet. I didn't tell anyone about it. I did a, quite a few distant sessions, but that was always people coming to me and asking me and I'd never advertised it or anything. And it was only because it was we felt it was a way that we could look after our clients and support our clients in a very unusual and very critical time that we even even shared the fact that we did it. OK, but I'm very glad we did because I've done hundreds of um, sessions in the last three months and about half of them have been distant sessions. The other half have been um, self shiatsu supervision. So that's what we've got in. That's what we've got in store for you next hour. OK, so let's um, find out something about you. I'd like to find out um, what you are. <laughs> are you a. Shiatsu student, a Shiatsu practitioner, Shiatsu teacher, a head of school, or maybe you're not involved in Shiatsu and you're just interested in uh, finding out about distance healing uh, and its relationship to Shiatsu. So maybe you can just let us know. Okay, right. 20% of you are students. Okay, cool. All right. And we haven't got any heads of school. That's quite unusual. No heads of schools. Usually we have two or three. Oh, we've got one. Three. Okay. Interesting. OK, so most of you are Shiatsu practitioners, which I guess we kind of expect. OK, another important thing I'd like to ask you is just how long have you practiced Shiatsu or any other healing modality? So if you did some sort of healing work for, say, 10 years before you did Shiatsu, I'd like you to add that on um, because I'd, I just want to get you and give I'd like to have an idea of how experienced you've been in working in healing work. Has it been about a year up to about five years? between five and 10, 20 years, more than 20 years. Okay, whoa, right, look at this. We have got a massively, massively experienced group here. We've got over a third of you have been doing shiatsu or some healing modality for over 20 years. Okay, so thank you for your time. Thank you for spending an hour with us on this. And if you add in those of you between 10 and 20 years, that's over half of you have had more than 10 years experience. Okay, so that's... It's kind of cool. That's really cool. Thank you for that. OK, so what I want to do now is ask you just one other question, which is, have you ever practiced any uh, distance healing techniques, either within Shiatsu or maybe in another modality? Let's find out how many of you have done that. And then uh, we can uh, work from there. And it gives me an idea of uh, where to pitch the, the webinar and also moving on through the course, also how we can do it. OK, look at that. Right, so three quarters of you have practiced distance healing. Whoa, okay, that's amazing. That's really cool. Okay, so that's like three quarters of you have practiced and a quarter of you haven't. So maybe just interested to find out about it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's proceed with the webinar. Um, okay, so I did obviously, when I was preparing for this course, I did um, quite a bit of research, you know. I was surprised actually at how little um, ethnographic research there was. I'll tell you, I'll talk to you about that later, but uh, there is um, quite a lot of research. We'll talk about that later, but things you need to know is first of all, distance healing um, is the most widespread form of complementary and alternative medicine. And that's why I think we as Shiatsu practitioners should know something about it. Okay. Certainly in the UK and the US in uh, 2000, I know it's a little while ago now, a survey, uh, there were 14,000 practitioners of 
what that is called distance healing intention therapies okay and i'll give you a reference to that uh, later on in the webinar okay so it's very widespread okay it's much more widespread than any other single form of complementary or alternative medicine so what exactly is it well in academic papers you'll hear you'll see it referred to as distance healing intention modality which basically means anything that involves um, healing at a distance and the assumption being the underlying assumption of any distance healing intention modality is that the healer the one who's giving the healing and the healee the person who's receiving the healing um, is not limited by distance so it actually doesn't matter at all whether you're a long way away or very near and that's how it's defined distance healing intention okay and it comes under many many names and these are just a few of them if you look at the article that i'll give you a link to later on and the links in the online course um you'll see that this is actually one of only i think this is only not even half of the different names it goes over okay intercessory prayer in other words praying for someone for them to get better spiritual healing auric healing qigong healing reiki shamanic healing and the list goes on these are all different modalities they've all got different forms different ways of structuring the the session um, but they all have the same characteristic in that distance is assumed not to be um, a limiting factor in the actual therapy okay um, right so the question that obviously the general public will probably want to know maybe not okay is can it possibly work because there's a lot of resistance to distance healing in contemporary culture rational culture and we'll find out why in a minute okay and one of the first reasons that we get a lot of resistance is because according to classical physics which is the newtonian physics model which is basically a clockwork universe that we are observing as a distant observer like this picture here okay it's impossible okay in fact it's not just impossible it's inconceivable that any information could be transmitted from say me or you to someone distant uh, if there's no medium like radio waves or you know any other type of communication medium it's just not conceivable in terms of classical physics and usually <clears throat> that's enough for people to think no it's just it must be just some kind of um you know whatever okay all right the other thing <clears throat> is about the other reason why it's uh, considered to be impossible is the whole idea of what consciousness is okay so consciousness as far as neuroscience is concerned and really what can physics and neuroscience tell us about consciousness well the answer is not very much at all because it's really just described as a subjective experience generated in the brain but physics and um, conventional physics and uh, neuroscience really haven't got a clue about how that could possibly happen or even the most basic idea of what consciousness is and that gives us a feeling that consciousness has to be in our brain and we have to be in a clockwork universe where it's impossible to connect with anything unless you've got a medium of communication okay so basically if you get those two things in combination classical physics the neuroscience um, that sees consciousness as a subjective experience you get the conclusion that distance healing is impossible and this is a very widely accepted rational view in the west and of course uh, that can lead to people having ideas that say distant healing techniques are some kind of crazy thing and it's like likely to bring shiatsu into disrepute um, and that's a, definitely a very real fear that some people have okay so we can understand why there's this very strong reaction to it but then we have to ask ourselves well is classical physics right i mean do we actually live in a classical universe as described by newton and those classical physicists and the answer is well no we don't in fact it, that's not the complete answer and to well okay it's completely wrong no we don't live in a universe like that einstein discovered that it's just not like that it's not that simple and we've got all kinds of strange things happening in quantum physics like spooky action at a distance 
entangled particles, wave particle duality, um, the collapse of the wave function, all of those things point to a much more connected, a much more, um, a, a much more, uh, um, a universe that's much more interconnected with consciousness itself. And that's caused a lot of problems for science to try and kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, so what about consciousness? Well, okay, neuroscience has this explanation. It doesn't really know how it happens, but somehow our consciousness appears and it's in our brains, okay? But that's, that's a relatively modern view that's developed over the last couple of hundred years. And it's completely at odds with the spiritual experience of literally thousands or tens of thousands of people through history, probably millions of people through history that have developed themselves through traditional cultures, um, developed spiritually, okay? And they've discovered through meditative techniques, through yoga, through, through Qigong, that in actual fact, consciousness isn't just um, inside the brain. And they've also discovered through their own personal experience that it is possible to connect with other people over a distance. And this has been the experience for thousands of years in every single traditional culture in the whole world. Okay, so the question I would ask yourself is, who would you really trust to give you good information about whether distance healing is possible? Scientists who don't know what consciousness is, they're hanging on to an old fashioned and outdated and falsified view of the universe, put that against thousands of years and thousands and thousands of people who have made their entire life study of it, um, who, knew, who have had personal experience. It's up to you to decide who you trust on that. But I know where I would put my trust anyway, or at least keep an open mind on it. <laughs> okay, so now we get to the next bit, which is what about the actual scientific experiments? Like, and there's basically three um, areas of scientific experiments, right? There's mind-to-mind -mind connections, in other words, making experiments to see whether somebody can communicate between each other. There's direct interactions between mind and matter. So you might have something, usually it's like a random generator or something on a computer and you have an intention focused on it to see whether you can change something happening. And then the other third type of experiment in this area, which we would be interested in, is what's called um, laboratory, laboratory analogues of uh, distance healing intention, right? What that means is they set up experiments that are similar in nature to what we would expect if we, um, you know, if we were doing uh, distance healing, what kind of mechanism what kind of um you know what kind of effects would it have okay and they're called distant mental interactions with living systems that's a bit of a mouthful isn't it distant mental interactions with living systems so that means can you use your mind to change a living system and it could be a human or it could be a plant or it could be a microbe or it could be a piece of body tissue or whatever and there's been lots and lots of experiments for this okay now, in DMILS protocols, okay, that's um, the analog of distance healing. There's three main uh, areas of study. There's influencing person A's intention on the physiological state of the receiver. In other words, maybe the heartbeat increases or skin resistance. There's a whole, there's loads of experiments. They've tried all different things, okay? This is an interesting one. The second category is called remote staring. It's like they get someone to stare at you over a video link. Are you feeling a bit strange if I do that? I bet you are, yeah. <laughs> and they just see whether by doing that they can um, change things uh, in the other person. And do you know what? Another interesting thing is they do like 30 second doses where they go use their intention for 30 seconds um, and then they have a break and they see whether anything changes that they can measure in the person who's being stared at, okay? And then there's the third category, which is A's influence on B on their attention on B or behavior. In other words, A can be thinking of B or giving intentional uh, information to them. And does that change their attention or does it change their behavior? 
do they feel different about themselves or do they act differently stuff like that and there's been many many studies okay so what's the evidence so far okay well distance healing intention and there's been lots of studies of this to try and see whether it can actually produce positive healing outcomes significantly over a big population and they those experiments so far have failed to show consistent results but they are very difficult things to organize they're usually huge numbers of people all praying in a general way for someone or some or a group of people and they're very difficult to measure okay but other um uh the dmils studies though which is your mental attention at a specific living thing it's much narrower okay they have shown clear results that it's possible and the paper that i'm referring to thinks that's because they are much easier to control and they're much easier to design okay so there are actually um there are actually studies that certainly show that there are potential effects of directing a uh, healing intention and changing um biological systems and things like that living things at a distance so that's kind of exciting okay because it means that there at least is a glimmer scientifically that it's possible but there's also another way of looking at it which is i looked into and i was surprised that there wasn't more material out there because i thought i would find scholarly studies of uh, ethnographic studies around the world of distance healing techniques in all these different cultures really hasn't been that much research on it however what we can say is that distant healing intention methods exist in every single traditional culture throughout the world okay and modern rational scientific world that we're living in now is the only culture in the world in the whole history of humankind that has not accepted um, dhi as being a natural healing modality okay the other really interesting thing is that spiritual development in all these cultures and the healing are considered to be one thing and they're combined together and that's another hint of why it's so difficult in the rational west for us to understand this because ever since the um renaissance and the scientific revolution and cartesian duality we've actually separated the spirit from the material world and that's uh one of the, another one of the reasons why we find it so hard to kind of understand that it's possible i'm not about me or you i'm just talking about the rational world around us okay but it's very interesting that that spiritual development and the healing together are considered to be one thing okay and so there's another important question from the cultural and ethnographic studies and that's the question is does spiritual and religious participation affect health out outcomes in other words if your client believes that there is a spiritual reality if they believe that distance uh, healing is uh, real if they believe that will it affect their health outcomes and again there's been hundreds of studies hundreds of studies on this and they all pretty much come out and the evidence is incredibly strong here that it totally does yes it does okay in other words people who believe in distance healing who believe in prayer believe in a spiritual reality have much much higher outcomes from recovering from illnesses recovering from operations and so on okay and as up to half the population in one survey i read about believed that if they were being prayed for um it would help their outcomes from their illness you know okay they believe that there's a lot of evidence scientific evidence that shows that they are absolutely right okay and what this has led to in even in conventional medicine now is that there has to be a respect for the spiritual um, understandings and the spiritual beliefs of the patient. Because if you don't respect the fact that your client or your patient um, has spiritual beliefs, you are actually threatening their health outcomes because you're undermining a belief system that they have. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. If you undermine that, you are reducing the likelihood of them having a positive health outcome, okay? So, that's a responsibility and that's another reason why i think it's important for us as shiatsu practitioners to have an understanding of 
um, distance healing and about and about the relationship between spiritual practice and health outcomes because we've got to be very careful even in conventional medicine they recognize this and so we don't want to be behind on that okay so basically it's actually scientifically proven that if you believe in DHI it's going to be better for your health and I think that's probably a good enough reason to believe in it just on its own okay but it's up to you to decide. Okay, now here are a couple of um, papers that I've referred to. Um, they're all a little bit old now, aren't they? 2015, it's five years old, but that's pretty good. Distance Healing Intention Therapy is an overview of the scientific evidence by Dean Radin um, and others. And um, uh, Marilyn Schnitz, Meditation, Prayer and Spiritual Healing, the Evidence. They're both very interesting papers and there's links to them on the online course. Okay, and there's loads and loads of... Um, uh stuff out there i can see the chats absolutely i'm trying not to look at the chat because i'll be here all day looking at it <laughs> um so what i'd like to do now is i'd like to get practical i'd like to get practical now we've got uh, half the webinar left um and i'd like to actually do some practical work with you would you like to do some practical work would you like to give me a thumbs up in the chat if you'd like that if you'd like to do some stuff yeah okay cool and in later webinars, we're going to look at all different ways of, that people do this type of work, and you'll find one that you really like. Next week, if you can make sure you've got someone who is willing to receive a session um, at this stage during the time that we're there, we'll talk about different times later on, of course, uh, that will be really cool. But today, I thought we'd just work on our own energy field, and we'll look at some of the practical things that we need to do to develop this type of work. OK, OK, I have to say, first of all, that I truly, truly believe the ethnographic studies um, that have shown that distance healing is a spiritual practice. Um, it's something that it is an advanced technique. Those of you who are students, maybe not been doing shiatsu or maybe not doing a healing modality for very long. Um, you know, you should take it easy and be patient with it. It's something that builds up over time. OK. Um, and it definitely can be developed through practice. That's what all the ethnographic studies say. And also, interestingly, some of the scientific studies have hinted that people with more experience of distance healing do get better results. So there is definitely a relationship there between practice and uh, results. OK, I want to tell you a story about when I went to study with Pauline Sasaki in the 80s. I asked her before I left, left from England to go and study with her for three months when I was apprenticed, I said to her, can you recommend a book that you uh, that would um, help me? And I thought she'd send uh, send me a book list all with all like Chinese medicine texts, you know, like heavy duty Chinese medicine texts. But she didn't. She said, oh, you should read this book. OK, and it's called Healing in the Mind World. And it's about health, healing, mental purification and the mind world. Um, and the, it's called Healing Mental Purification Mind World. And it was recommended to me by Pauline. And basically, it describes healing in a way that's very similar to Qigong, yoga, and pretty much every other um, distance healing intention modality. And funnily enough, when I was doing the research for this course, I just happened to open the book. And what should happen? But it fell open on a page about distance healing. Not bad, OK? Someone's looking after me. OK, if you believe any believe that stuff, uh, <laughs> it was a complete coincidence. And um, <laughs> and here he is. Here he is, the man himself. OK, he was a musician before he became a Sufi uh, healer and like a, like a prophet. He says in the book, I read it. I thought, well, this is good. I said uh, it says there's three things that you need to do distance healing work. He actually says it in the book. He says that you need faith in the theory. In other words, you have to believe that it's possible, that we're in an interconnected universe and that that is possible. You need self-confidence, that you're confident you can do it. And you need to have power of concentration. OK, so I thought we'd do a quick poll. Just figure out where you are with Hazrat. <laughs> three requirements for uh, distance healing modalities. OK. So let's do the first one first. OK, how much faith do you have in distance healing theory? Do you think we live in an interconnected world where it's possible for one mind to connect to another 
person. And let's see how many people. I know a lot of you are already doing distance healing, so I guess I assume that you've probably got reasonably reasonable faith in it. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Okay, so most of you have complete faith or faith that it's possible, okay? And there's none of you so far who don't believe it's possible. I guess you probably wouldn't be on this webinar if you if you did. Okay, now let's just work on your self-confidence. Um, so, yeah, how confident are you in your ability to deliver uh, distance healing? So what's your confidence level, your self-confidence like? Right. OK, so here we go. Now we're finding out. OK, so all of you had the belief or neutral, but some of you are definitely not confident. In fact, quite a lot of you are neutral, not confident or completely not confident. <laughs> to 19, that's 29 percent. Yeah. OK, that's about a third of you. OK, so that's perfectly understandable. OK, and um, it's nothing to, you know, it's nothing to worry about at all. I mean, it's quite understandable because it takes quite a long time and experimenting and getting feedback to feel confident because it's a very advanced kind of technique um, and it takes time to do it that's absolutely fine and now the other one the third one the third test of Hazrat's tests is the power of concentration so if you were doing a distance session you were set up and we'll talk about how to do that in the next and following webinars you're all set up you're ready to go how good do you think you are in keeping that concentration level okay you have to basically concentrate your key um, with intention there's various techniques we can use but in terms of doing that um how would you test your ability to concentrate your key what do you think is it very strong strong neutral or weak in terms of your ability to right okay so there we are there we have the answer that's it okay good that's your answer right so we've got 20 odd 23 percent 24 percent of you feel neutral or you feel your concentration is weak okay that's fine if you want to do distance healing work if you're if you believe if you believe in the theory if you think it's possible and you can build up your self-confidence and your power of concentration through exercises like anything else, okay? And we're gonna start doing that right now, okay? These are the three requirements. Okay, we're gonna take it nice and easy and we're gonna build up how we do it, okay? So we've done that, we found out your faith in the theory, your self-confidence, the power of concentration. Okay, cool, right, ready to do some practical work, right? Now what we're gonna do now is we're gonna tune into our own energy field on four levels and i think this is a fundamental exercise for distance work and the reason for that is because of the relationship with spiritual practice with healing work and through and especially distance healing work just like with conventional face-to-face -face shiatsu we do a lot of work on ourselves um, we do a lot of work centering our energy in the hara relaxing aligning and all that stuff okay and it's even more important with distant work because with distant work we don't have the physical information um, uh, in the session. However, sometimes, and Gabriella will talk about this in a couple of weeks, she actually found it was actually easier to tune in uh, at a distance because the body wasn't confusing it. She got um, clearer, folk, uh, clearer information about the energy field. Okay, so it can happen. So we need to tune into our own field on four levels. And then what we need to do, we need to practice quietening down each level. And I've found that practically because... I've been doing hundreds of sessions here over the last three months. And one of the things I've noticed is that even more than in face-to-face -face sessions, if anything's happening it's strongly in your own energy field, because you're in a phase resonance with the person that you're working on, that can kind of get in the way and you can start picking up your own stuff. And on many, many occasions, I've picked up things. I thought, mm, I don't know if it's mine or theirs. And I've gone back, I've done this exercise. I've gone through the levels cleared it out, quietened it down, and then I've got a clearer picture. So I know it works, okay? And then if this time, I just like to do a nice, quick concentration, training concentration exercise with you, okay? To fulfill one of Hazrat's things, okay? Now you're gonna need to run and get some paper. I've got mine here. If you've been on webinars before, you've probably got it ready already because you know what I'm like. I love drawing, 
uh, pictures and stuff. So let's <clears throat> stop sharing the presentation and you can see me still light. Isn't it beautiful, a beautiful night? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just draw four boxes. And you may have done this before, quite possibly done this exercise before, but it always, it's one of these exercises that's always worth repeating and um, it's definitely worth um, repeating it, especially as we're gonna go on to the next stage, which is quietening down each level, okay? Okay, so if you just follow me, I'm gonna do it with you and we'll just see what information we get. Also, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to tune in to uh, the different auric layers because uh, I found that's also useful um, again, doesn't matter if you believe in them or not. It's a model which is useful for structuring information. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Let's start. Okay, so you've got your pen and paper ready. And we're going to close our eyes. I'm going to do it with you. So let's just close our eyes. We're going to tune in internally and we're tuning into our physical body. Okay, so I'm scanning through my body and I'd like you to do the same. And I want you to just ask a simple question, which is, what is it like? What's your physical body like? Okay, and what I'd like you to do now, once you've got an idea, you can turn that into an image, just wait, open your eyes, and draw in the first box what your physical body is like. Okay, maybe it feels blocked, maybe it feels like something, metaphorical, it doesn't matter. All right, got that? Just a nice simple sketch of the main things you felt. Very good. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the next one, which is the emotional level, okay? So we're going to, first of all, close our eyes again. And this time we're gonna bring our awareness, not just to the limits of the physical body, but we're a little bit further out into the space around us. And we're going to tune in to the emotional body. Okay, it's tuning into our emotional body. And we're asking ourselves the same question, what is it like? Okay, and then we're gonna open our eyes and we're gonna draw that, okay, in the second box. Okay, got that. Great, I'll show you my picture in a minute. <clears throat> right, good, and then we have um the mental level that's the mind level okay let's see what that's like yeah should we do that so we're going to close our eyes again and we're going to tune into the mental level of energy and we're going to open our awareness out away from our body again a little bit further around around our body and we're going to tune into our mental or our thought body And we're going to ask ourselves the same question. What is that like? Okay. All right. And we're going to draw that in the third box. Okay, got it. 
Very good. Okay, so we're on to the fourth level now. And so we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to imagine our energy body a bit bigger, like an egg around us, okay? Just imagine that we've got space around us and we're going to tune in on the spiritual level. Okay, and we're asking ourselves, what's it like? What's our spiritual body like? Okay, and then if you can uh, turn that into an image, and we're going to draw it into in the last box. Okay, very good. All right, so you should have a picture. It probably won't look anything like me if you've got... <laughs> Hopefully not. Otherwise, I pity you. No, not really. OK, but that this is uh, my pictures. But the main thing uh, that stage one of the exercise, the second stage of the exercise is to see how uh, which levels are easy to quieten down and which levels are more difficult. So I'm going to talk you through this and then we'll make some notes. And I've got a poll for you at the end of this exercise. OK, so let's do it. All right. You should have a reasonable idea of what it's like, of what your energy is like on the different levels. So let's do the next stage, which is quietening them down and seeing how easy that is to do. All right? And I'll do it with you. All right. We'll just see how we get on. OK, so let's first of all close our eyes. And we're going to tune in on the physical level. You might find you a bit uncomfortable somewhere. You might feel that something's blocked. There might be bits of your body that come into your attention. OK. And what we're going to do now is we're going to try and make that uh, make that feeling of our physical body as quiet as possible. And the way we can do that is by relaxing, first of all. OK, so we can get a nice alignment, relaxing the head upwards, sinking the sacrum down, releasing the physical body. OK, got that. Very good. OK, and the next stage is to kind of imagine that we're invisible. So just imagine that your physical body is kind of dissolving and it's becoming kind of empty and very quiet and very empty. You got that? That's good. Right. OK, now keep that nice and quiet and shift up onto the emotional level. Remember what that was like. If you've forgotten, have a quick look at your paper to remind you of what it's like. OK, I'll get locked back into that feeling on the emotional level. And now again, we're going to try and quieten that down. So take any experiences you can feel anywhere in your energy and we're just going to make them smaller and quieter and calmer. Very good. OK. And then let's make them more invisible. So see if they kind of blend into the invisibility of the physical invisibility that we've just set up, if that makes any sense. Yeah. OK, so it's nice and calm emotionally, quietening it down, making it invisible. Very good. Excellent. OK, let's go up. We've got two more to do. Two more levels to do. So keeping our eyes closed. We're going up onto the mental level. Remember what that was like in your drawing? We do the same thing. We use our alignment to relax our physical body, relax our emotional body. And now we're going to relax the mind. It really doesn't matter. You can just relax your mind, give it some space. And then quieten down 
your thoughts. You're making them invisible, just like the other levels. You're just observing your thoughts, but you're just letting go of them, making them quiet until you can't really experience them anymore. Very good. Very good. Okay. Just leave them like that. And we're going to go up onto the spiritual level now and do the same thing. Okay. So same, same kind of idea. Tuning into our spiritual level again. Try and get a sense of the energy around your body. <coughs> okay, now we're very, we've got very quiet and invisible physical body, a quiet and invisible emotional body quiet and invisible mental body or thought body. And so now we're going to make ourselves as quiet as we can on the spiritual level. So just get in touch with that feeling all around you. Make it quieter and more peaceful. Just with your intention. Very good. Okay, so now you should feel a nice, very relaxed, spacious, calm, relaxed space where you feel kind of invisible. All right. And what I'd like you to do now is just reflect on which levels, which level was the easiest to make yourself invisible and which one was the most challenging okay and i'd like you to just record that because this is going to be very good for your own personal practice to see which ones you're most likely to have trouble quietening down okay it's very good for your own personal practice so we're going to just write on there okay so uh, Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, launch a poll now and we'll find out as a group, which ones you found the most, um, yeah, which level was the easiest for you to quieten down? Let's just see which was the easiest to quieten down. Be very interested to see this. That's so interesting. Okay. So the, the two big ones are the physical and the spiritual. Very interesting indeed. Very interesting. Okay, so if you'd just like to vote on that poll. So we had like 30% of you found the physical, 18% emotional, 12% mental, um, and 39% spiritual. So conversely, let's, let's ask you the other way around. Which level was the most challenging to quiet and I guess it's going to be the mental level isn't it yeah and it could be just because you're on a webinar you're thinking about things you're thinking about you know whether it's possible to do distant healing and you're kind of processing things so it could be that but it'd be definitely worth um checking out on your own as part of your own practice when you're doing your exercises or your meditation or whatever you're doing just try it out and see when you're away from a webinar when you're doing your own practice which is the easiest to, to do and the most difficult and work on those ones. Okay. We do other similar exercises like that as the course goes on um, because it's possible also to do it with the chakras and other stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, cool. Cool. Um, right. We've got 10 questions. Oh my goodness. Oh, they've been. Um, uh, right. Okay. We've got loads of questions. Maybe we can uh, just do this quick other exercise before I have a look at the questions, which is uh, a concentration exercise. 
So um, we're going to be, we've quietened our field, we've tuned into four levels, we've quietened our field. So I just thought we'd do a simple exercise on practicing concentration. And what I'm going to get you to do with this is I'm going to literally get you to do nothing other than to stare and concentrate your intention on one object in your room. So what shall I keep? I'm going to look out the window here. We've got a nice window box and I've got a plant that I'm going to, I'm going to stare at. OK, I'm going to use my intention. I'm just going to see whether I'm going to time you for one minute and I'm going to see um, whether you can maintain focused, connect, focused connection with an external object with your mind. I know your mind is only subjective in your in your brain. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm going to see if you can literally connect your mind with an external object um, and uh, and do it for one minute. Are you ready? OK, so I'm going to actually literally going to turn around. I'm going to focus on a particularly nice red um, flower that's on the window box. In fact, there's four of them. All right. And I'm going to practice that. Uh, I've got my watch here. I've got my stopwatch. OK, and I'm going to time us for one minute and see whether we can do it i'm going to warm you up into it all right so i want you to look away from the screen you can just still hear my voice but uh look away from the screen and uh try this okay so looking away from the screen so you can't see the computer or the device that you're using your phone or tablet pick something in the room that you can look at okay i'll get my stopwatch ready <coughs> OK. And what we're going to do is we're going I'm going to talk you through until we engage our, our focused mental intention on that um, object. And then once we've got it, OK, we're going to see if we can maintain it consistently for one minute. OK, so this is how we do it. Right. We're going to align ourselves, first of all. So we're nice and comfortable. OK, so you've got your head top floating up. Sacrum hanging down, relaxing our physical body. All right. Now, keeping your intention, your focus, or your attention, I should say, on that object, I'd like you to quieten down your physical body. Quieten down your emotional body. Relax your mind so your focus is solely on that object. OK, so you're just aware of that object in the room. And then quieten down your spiritual body as well. So you're making your whole energy field as invisible as possible. And as you do that, you'll find that the, your attention on that object outside of your body becomes your dominant experience. OK, so let's just see if we can do that so that that becomes our dominant experience. Got it? OK, that's pretty good. Right. Now let's see if we can do it for one minute, starting from now. Keeping relaxed, keep focused, quieten yourself down, okay, it's 30 seconds, 30 seconds to go, keep your focus. Twenty seconds left. Okay, keep focused. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and then relax, come back into your body, feel your body again. Okay, so now let's have it. Let's have an instant reaction in the chat, okay? If you pretty much kept your focus on that external object for the whole minute, I want you to put your thumb up like that. If you didn't, okay, if you couldn't, it doesn't matter, 
you can put your hand, if you're kind of neutral, you can put your hand up like this. Or if you definitely couldn't focus for, for that time, you can just do this. Didn't make it. <laughs> so let's just see. Okay, so most of you seem to be fairly happy. Okay, it's very interesting because the research that I read tended to use 30 second doses of, um, of um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one, Jose, I like that. Um, yeah, um, yeah, the 30 sec a lot of the experiments used 30 second doses. So they thought, so you did double that people, you did double the normal dose that's used for experiments. So you should be proud of yourself. OK, <clears throat> that sensation that we had, though, of focusing our consciousness or our atten attention outside our body to another living thing like a plant or it can be a, even an inanimate thing. That is very well. That is exactly actually what it's like when you do a distant session. You actually create a phase relationship and you um, basically transfer most of your awareness to that distant person or whatever it is that you're tuning into. OK, so it's a basic exercise, something you can work on in your own spiritual practice. It's very similar to lots of meditative techniques. If you've ever done yoga, qigong or anything like that, you recognize it. OK, cool. So let's just have a quick look through some of the questions. Um, all right. Rachel asked about uh, distant healing sessions um, for retrieval. OK, Rachel has been doing a homework. Well done, Rachel. OK, that's not specifically uh, a technique in Dean's book, the, it, but all of the components that are required are described uh, with remote viewing. If you look at the remote viewing um, experiments, what they did was they found out with remote viewing that it doesn't actually matter whether the person who's doing the remote viewing um, uh, gives the information before, after or during. And there's actually some more information in some of the resources about that in some of the resources on this course that I've linked inside the course. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not described as a specific thing, but that the actual techniques are in that book. Um, CEs are continuing educate. Yep. Yeah. So this is this question. Yep. Yeah. So that's very good, Rachel. She's been doing a homework reading that book. Um, yep. Yeah. CEs are continuing ed. Um, Oh, yeah. OK, so that's Rachel again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Quantum entanglement, Barbara, is, yeah, it's basically they found, discovered that two particles that are entangled can be separated by any distance. And if something's done to one, it affects the other one and no one really knows how. So they're in pretty much the same situation as we are with distance healing. But they're scientists. So, you know, they're allowed to be. <laughs> um is hypnosis a form of distance healing? Not strictly speaking, but it's there are some overlapping things. This is Charlotte, yeah. Um, of course, it can be done at a distance. Uh, yep, the reference, Melinda, the reference info is all on the online course. It's free to access. Um, yep, so you can just go and have a look in there. Um, yeah, I've got, uh, this is Rose. Yeah, I've got two papers that I recommend that are on the online course. I can send them uh, with an email as well if you if you want. Um, yeah, there's uh, Daniela mentioned the Mind and Life Institute research. There's yes, also lots several of people other people were offering um, suggestions of research studies. I mean, there are yes, tons there out are there. yes, yeah. there are lots. Yeah, there, there are some very serious scientists, a lot of whom I actually know. <laughs> um, you know, like James Oshman and. Uh, Emilio de Giudici was a great example. He was a quantum physicist and he was really into all this stuff. Sadly, he's died now. Um, but um, Jenny mentioned um, the witch hunts. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, obviously, um, you know, the I can understand a rational worldview was against superstition and there's lots of good things in that. But it's almost like the whole tide has changed now where uh, any anything that doesn't fit the classical model is uh, uh, can be discriminated against. You've only got to look at Wikipedia, by the way, and the whole skeptic thing to see that. Um, yep, look at this, some really good recommendations, aren't there? Um, oh, how, how to handle physical pain as a distraction from concentration. Yeah, that's a really tough one, uh, Karen. I'll just put that up. That is tough. That is a real tough one. Um, can you treat a post-stroke person? Yes, Tony, you can treat anyone uh, basically but we can um it's 
you know, it's a, it's a healing modality, so you can use it to do anything, okay? So I really hope you've enjoyed the webinar. I've had a lot of fun, as you can see. I've been, it's been so much fun putting the information together. And be sure to tune in next week. We're going to do a natural practical. Find someone you can work with, um, and we'll do a session. And I'll take you through some of the early techniques I used uh, because I've been developing this over the last 20 years or so. So, yeah, um, if you just like to, if you enjoyed the webinar, just put a, oh, you've already done it. You've got, I've got loads of hearts. And <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you very much, Dinah. It's been in a very, very active chat. Um, and yeah, cool. Diego's there. It's great to see so many familiar faces. See you next week. Have a good week. Do some practice. Make yourself invisible. Start concentrating. <laughs>